it's my belief that in the long term that kind of wasting time is absolutely essential and necessary for new discoveries in creativity Hello, I'm Neil Perkin, the host of Think with Google Firestarters. And Firestarters is a series of insightful conversations for the interested and the interesting of the marketing strategy and innovation communities. And today, I'm fortunate enough to be speaking with Kevin Kelly, uh, who you no doubt know. Kevin Kelly is senior maverick at uh, Wired, uh, of course, the award-winning magazine which he co-founded in 1993. He's also co-chair of the Long Now Foundation, a membership organization that champions long-term thinking and also founder of the the popular cool tools uh, website which has been reviewing tools daily on a daily basis now for about 20 years uh, he is of course the author of uh, multiple best-selling uh, books about the future of uh, technology including the inevitable which is understanding the 12 technological forces that will shape our future uh, also what what technology wants and his newest book is called excellent advice for living which is a book of 450 modern proverbs for a pretty good life um so he is known of course for his radical optimism so kevin if it's all right i'm going to start there um welcome to firestarters and i'd just like to ask you why you believe that radical optimism is important when thinking about uh, technology features well, Neil, thank you for inviting me. I'm really honored to be here. Um, I'm looking forward to this conversation. So radical optimism, uh, first of all, I would say optimism is less of a temperament and more of a choice. It's almost a skill. You can, I, I've, I have, I, I, while I am maybe naturally optimistic, I have become even more apt optimistic in, in a deliberate choice as the years go on. And I think the reason why I believe we all should be as optimistic as we can be um, is because um, it's, it's really the only way that we're going to make a future that we want to live in. So if you look around your room right now and the listeners look around their room, most of the things in that room were produced by people who are optimistic. They were invented by people who believed that, you know, LED lighting or um, the, the, a microphone or, you know, st stress tresses or vacuum layered glass was possible when many people did not believe that. And so, in a way, our world has been made by optimists and therefore it's likely that the future world will be made by people who believe that this thing that they're trying to make that's as good and complicated you we need to see it first we have to imagine it and imagine that it's possible that's optimism we're not going to make a world that's complicated and yet we want to live in inadvertently just accidentally it's too hard we actually have to see it first. We have to believe that it's possible. And that is an act of optimism. And therefore, optimists are going to shape our future. And if you want to shape our future, you need to be optimistic. Yeah, I love that. And I just wonder if here, um, when you were talking there about um, the importance of uh, possible futures, I guess, imagination, the importance of imagination, and uh, we obviously have a lot of, um, you know, uh, people, uh, an audience here in Fastasters that work in large businesses or agencies and so on. And uh, so that idea of imagination feels like it's undervalued, perhaps, in business. You know, the the ability to just reimagine futures. Um, do you think that's the case? What's what's holding people yeah. back from imagination? The 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 the, the thing that's the most difficult in um, imagining or exercising the imagination of where what is possible and where we could go is letting go of what everybody knows of letting go of what we expect what everybody expects and that is is really really hard it's much harder than you than, than you think but we are incredibly bound by our assumptions and um most of what everybody knows is true but a lot of what everybody knows is not true. And we and it's very hard to see whether that what that is. And so challenging 
challenging or, or, or exceeding or transcending your assumptions is very, very difficult. And you have to have willing suspension of, of disbelief to, to get it. So you have to say, well, something that we all assume that, you know, we all assume that, um, you know, um, school children will hate homework. Well, this, we don't even question that, but but maybe if you question it, if you it, you say, well, what would it take? What if, what if suddenly in fifty year years they love doing it? What would have happened in fifty years to make them love doing homework? And um, what were we wrong about? And how did we get there? And if that was true, what else would also be true? Or if whatever that produced that change would also produce other changes? And so you you're you're transcending that it's something of what, what everybody knew. And that's really, really hard to do because we have we've been trained to expect certain things about how the world works or where we're going. But one of the things we know about the future is it's not going to be reasonable. It's going to be something that we would kind of like, you, you would not check off on. If, if a script writer wrote the script for today, what's happening today, nobody would approve the script. They were saying, that's, that's not going to happen. That's impossible. And so, so that so letting go of what we know, and 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 letting go of our assumptions, that's the really hard part. It's not imagining alternatives. It's transcending what we think we know right now. And do you, I, I guess um, one way of thinking about this would be, I get what you might call toxic assumptions, I suppose, which are assumptions which you don't even realize are assumptions, perhaps. Um, yeah, you know, toxic is business. a strong, strong word. I would say maybe embedded assumptions or or, or whatever. But um, yeah, I, I don't know if I'd put the value of toxic on on it. Just that it's holding. It, it's, it's they're uh, they're unexamined assumptions. And to be truthful, we can't spend all our day examining every single one of our assumptions. The, the, you know the reason why there are assumptions is that we don't have to bother with it we can just go on but when you're trying to do something new or different or to think about the future th then you have to be able to do that you know step by step and it's hard i know from working with scenarios in in many many situations when people try to think about like what will happen where the future is it is very difficult to get anyone including myself to to go in, in a to, to arrive at at somewhere different because we have expectations about we have even images of what the future is mm -hmm. and those yeah. images are are they form what we think is even possible and so um um and so Thinking further ahead, trying to let those go, is 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 difficult. That is the challenge. And so, um, any tips? I, I guess I'm going to ask you a two part question here. If that's all right, sure. uh, any tips about how you can um, think that far ahead and break open your assumptions and try to think uh, imaginatively about what the yeah. future will be, and then. The second part of the question is then how do you bring that back to the present to understand what you need to do now in order to make exactly. a future right. like that happen? Yeah, I mean there are there are, there are lots of exercises and, and and it's 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 a muscle that you have to learn how like doing you know multiplication. You kind of have to kind of do it many, many times and you understand in a certain sense that there's a there's a little there's a little uh, routine that you can do, uh, something you can play with. And the and the extra and one of the the uh, common not a common but what I, a very effective way that I've seen is to um, start with a premise in the future and ask people how how we might arrive there. So so you 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 say okay you know as I was just saying with homework you know in in the future let's say um, there's uh, uh, there's mental telepathy between humans. And so how, I, I come back and I tell you, yeah, actually, th this is, actually, in, in 100 years from now, I'm, I'm coming back. I'm a visitor from the future. I'm arriving from 100 years. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, by the way, um, we don't have elections anymore. 
we we have a democracy without elections. And you say, what? what? And so I say, I'm just telling you, that's what it is. And so you would say, well, how did we get there? What's the story of 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 arriving at this thing with democracy without elections? And so you kind of it blows my mind. And, and so you make up you make up stories, and you're kind of relieved from trying to think that well, that's not reasonable, or you know, that's impossible. I'm no, I'm telling you that the impossible thing is let's make a story about how the impossible thing happens. And you can do that kind of in many, many ways. Let's, uh, uh, my friend Brian Eno, we do this exercise called uh, unthinkable. So unthinkable would be, you know, um, barbecue um, produces these burnt things that are, the, 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 the burnt part of a barbecue is incredibly carcinogenic. Th this is something we know right now. And so the idea was, well, maybe in the future, barbecue is outlawed, is prohibited because it's carcinogenic. And so it's like, what what would happen if I come back and told you in 25 years, any kind of barbecue is prohibited? So there'd be like, okay, well, maybe there's underground barbecue places. And you know, it, so you can kind of start to imagine a world, even though that might seem like impossible, that, that but you're given an assignment and then you, you're asked to make a story. And that exercise can liberate you and help you overcome the resistance that you have of of your assumptions, and so um, I, I find that one of the most useful exercises is to, to be given the assignment of the impossible, saying there's no choice about this. Your assignment is to make up a story of how we could possibly have gotten there. Yeah, great. And one of the interesting things I think actually um, in your book, the inevitable, um, the approach that you took around. Um, the 12 technological forces mm -hmm. so these were kind of underlying forces and one of the things that has been a consistent theme in firestarters is, is trying to sort of separate out really the trends to pay attention to the kind of underlying forces if you like so i was really intrigued by the kind of approach you would taken in that book mm -hmm. about talking about things like you know to list a few of them cognifying so everything's going to be intelligent uh you know accessing nobody owns anything mm -hmm. you know sharing mm -hmm. if things can be shared you know all of that so you had lots of these kind of underlying forces and that was an interesting approach so why did you um what, what's the value do you think if you were to talk to an organization about understanding the future what's the value in understanding the underlying forces rather than the technical innovations like vr and ai and looking at it in that way yeah um i think one of the things we know about evolution and, and other kinds of systems, and, and we're in a we're in a technological system that has many similarities with evolution, is that um, specific things are not predictable at all. They're completely stochastic and random. And so, um, even if we knew the history of this, if we reround the tape of life, that's the kind of that's the kind of little premise. If you go back to the beginning, the same starting point, and you had life on Earth again and again, you were running it many times. Um, uh, a zebra is not inevitable. It's 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 a very specific thing. But quadrupeds, an animal with four feet, would would happen again and again because that is that is a a a design that's very, very stable, very, very practical, what I would call inevitable. So quadrupeds are inevitable, but zebras aren't. The larger designs of things are, but the specifics are not. So once you have electricity on a planet, any planet in the galaxy is going to make telephones. But the iPhone is not inevitable. You know the particulars, the specifics. So, 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 I think it's important to to understand that as we're thinking about futures, is that there are there are things that are inevitable in, in terms of their general outline plan, but specific things, specific products, specific companies are are not predictable at all. And so, AI is coming. Who owns AI? how it's run, is it national or international? What are the different characters? Those are not inevitable, and we have a lot of choice about them. 
and they're not predictable. Um, and so, um, so we have to work at the right level, and the right level is AI, because we know from evolution that evolution made minds many times, so this kind of wants minds, minds are this thing. So we're gonna get minds, artificial minds. But a lot of the specifics of it are completely unpredictable. And you, it's interesting when you, um, in what technology wants, you talk about the this concept of the technium. And um, so this being, of course, uh, viewing technology almost like a natural system. system um, right. Uh, and you mentioned about how you know, technology is kind of an extension of humans, so viewing it that way, um, not an extension of our genes, I think you say, but an extension of our minds, um, and it's an extended body of ideas. So one of the things that stuck with me about that was um, this idea of it being a sort of self-amplifying entity. So, mm -hmm. you know, breakthroughs, you, you get these kind of infinite loop of more breakthroughs from breakthroughs. So I think the one I remember is from the invention of language leading to invention of the alphabet and books and then libraries and then the internet mm -hmm. so that idea of this sort of building momentum behind certain yeah. forces um what's the way in which in which we can understand that as as how that will yeah. shape our future yeah so so we we have we've seen in the past we have enabling technologies that the invention of that thing enables other things and one of the great enablers of all time was the invention of the scientific method like that was the problem with china china invented almost all the major inventions in history until the scientific age were invented in china first but they missed the greatest invention of all time which was the scientific method which was invented later in europe and so um so the scientific method was this uber master golden invention that enabled all these other kinds of things and um you know language was another one of those inventions enabling inventions and now we're in the middle or the excuse me we're at the beginning of another one of those which is ai which is this enabling invention that's going to enable all kinds of other inventions coming from it it will speed up drug discovery it's going to speed up environmental science it's it's it, it's, it's it'll make the vr uh, augmented mirror worlds possible none of those can ever happen without ai and so ai is this this techno suite of technologies that we're going to enable so many other things and that's what again why the ex there's there is the excitement it's just not so you can answer our questions which you can do but it's total consequences much much grander than that which is that it's going to enable it quicker advances and all these other things is, is very equivalent to the invention of the scientific method in that sense of the way it's going to unleash um, innovation, creativity and other in other domains. And are there certain characteristics of those, I guess you call them keystone inventions, I suppose, because they lead yeah. on to other many other mm -hmm. inventions. Are there certain characteristics that we can recognize when one is a keystone invention and one not? One thing that, say, the invention of AI and the scientific method and language have in common is that they are um, they're intangible, but but more importantly, they're complex. They're 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 they're, they're, they're like the, the scientific method was not just a single thing; it was invented over time, and it has it's a complex of many things. Same thing with language; it was not invented all at once. And same thing with AI; it's a very complicated thing. We're just at the beginning. And so it's something that's that's an accumulation of lots of different things. And so it's closer to almost like a process than it is to an actually finished product. So it's in process itself. And so that is one of the one of the ways it gets its power is the fact that it's process oriented and itself is in a process of getting better. Brilliant. I'm going, to, I'm going to switch gears slightly, if I may, and just um, move on to your latest book, which is uh, Excellent Advice for the Living, because um, uh, I'm a, a long-time reader of um, your brilliant blog post that uh, you've written over a number of years about um, pieces of advice that you wish you'd known. And uh, so you've turned them into uh, what is an, a, an exceptional book uh, with these 450 uh, sort of, I guess, rules for living or uh, yeah. just advice for living. Proverbs um, or maxims, yeah. 
Right, proverbs, yeah, and and they are brilliant. And um, about many, they're very broad ranging. But I just mm -hmm. I, I picked out a few themes here, which I'd like to ask you about. Um, sure. So one is about learning, because there was quite a, a, a lumber in there about what you might call lifelong learning. So just to give you a few examples for the the listeners and uh, viewers. Uh, so you talk about things like uh, the best way to learn anything is to try to teach what you know. Um, right. I guess it relates to what Richard Feynman has talked about before. Now, the, if you're the smartest person in the room, you are in the wrong room, which is great. <laughs> I love that one. Uh, and also, um, a worthy goal for a year is to learn enough about a subject so that you can, so that you can't believe how ignorant you were a year earlier. That's right. great. <laughs> so I'd just like to to ask you about. Um, Obviously, learning and being a lifelong learner is important to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what keeps you as a, as a lifelong learner? Oh, what keeps me? Um, I, I, I have to say, well, several. One, one is, the, you know, it's, it's a joy. It's a pleasure. It's, it's, it's playfulness. It's, um, it's something that I just enjoy doing. And then I would say, on top of that, I've been rewarded for doing it. And um, in many, many ways. And I would say one of the things that um, someone was the other day lamenting the fact that, that they um, spend a lot of time going down Wikipedia rabbit holes, right? That you, you get into this thing where one thing is leading to another in Wikipedia, and then before you know it, hours are, are done. And they were trying to, they wanted advice about how to overcome that. And it's like, no, that's the main thing. That's not something that I would try and predict. That was something that I would try and encourage. Because it's my belief that in the long term, that kind of wasting time is absolutely essential and necessary for new discoveries in creativity and um, novelty. And, and it's one of the reasons why most of the really great new things are invented by young people rather than older people, because young people are wasting time. They're, 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 they, they're very good at kind of spending things that don't have a goal or, or spending time without a goal other than just to enjoy that time to learn without necessarily a goal in mind. And that is much more likely to produce novel ideas and new directions and new understandings than goal oriented learning. And so um, there is, there is something to be said for, you know, learning in on-demand learning where you where you are learning something in order to get something done that's that's perfectly fine and really good and good to know how to do and is a great way to learn but there's also another element of that kind of playful learning where you are learning for the joy of it and you don't know what it's going to do and i and i surmise and i'm suggesting that that's just as equally powerful and needed as the goal-directed learning and um, in, in my experience, um, you know, Steve Jobs had a great example of where he, in college, took calligraphy classes, which was just for the sheer pleasure that he had. And people were like, why are you wasting time with that calligraphy? And he credits that with going onto the Macintosh and becoming interested in fonts and doing the first typographic um, tool available to every person. and came from his wasting time with calligraphy. And so um, I think I, I, I think that playful learning is something we really want to protect and rather than try to minimize. Do you think is is it a habit um, that we need to develop? do you think? Yes, I think it's a habit. I think it's a habit that um, again, right now people, Look down upon it. That was a distraction. I'm trying to minimize the number of hours. And I'm saying no, no. You, 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 you want to arrange your life so you can do that all the time. That's that's a better thing. It's not like so. So so so. The, I have a little beef with some of the producti productivity people 
because uh, the, 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 the masters like David Allen understand this, but not everybody does, which is, you know, you don't want to arrange your life so that you minimize the number of hours that you spend doing things. You want to arrange your life so that you maximize the number of hours of things that you'd never want to stop doing. Okay. Yep. And so that's like, if you really, really enjoy doing that and that going down the rabbit holes, then you should be aiming to make your life permit that as much as possible rather than try to minimize it. I, I did pick out one um, of the proverbs on, on about habit actually. And you mentioned about how habit is far more dependable than uh, inspiration. Um, right. And you make progress by making habits, which is a really interesting right. point. So t talk to me a bit about, you know, for people looking to kind of make progress against things, how do you, how do you sort of create those habits and, uh, uh, and embed that into what you're actually doing? Yeah, I almost I kind of want to punt here because um, the book Atomic Habits, if you haven't read it, you really should. Um, it It's the master class and um, talking about habits of both uh, um, acquiring good habits and, you know, unacquiring bad habits. Um, and he knows more about it than, than I do. But I, I think in general, um, that is one of the tricks is that you you take something you're doing habitually and you kind of move it towards doing it in a well and you make, so you make doing a habit as easy as possible. You kind of try to make it the default so you don't have to think about it. And, um, you have, you try and, and for the bad habits, you try and replace them with good habits because you still have the habitual response. So you're trying to substitute them. So, um, so there is a lot known about, acquiring good habits and um, letting go of bad habits. Um, and I just suggest that someone read one of those like Atomic Habits, James Clear's book as, as, a, a, as a start. But it is true that creativity and um, genesis and, and making things and making things happen, um, can 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 become habits and should become habits in order to to get better at it and like a habit one, one of the things about a habit and creativity is that what we know about creativity is that you have to produce a lot of it to get really great stuff you and you most of what you produce is going to be crap and that that's not something that should stop you from doing it the amateur will write a first write a book and the first draft of it is terrible and they'll think ah oh, i can't write Nobody likes this. I'm going to stop. The professional realizes, no, that's just an unnecessary thing. The first draft is going to be terrible, but the way you make something great is you make a habit. You go back to it again and again. You iterate forward. You rewrite it multiple times. You write a little bit each day as a habit. And that is the way. So that you going through the, the crappy thing is necessary to get to the good. You cannot get there. Any other way, and um, Ed Catmull's great book on creativity with Pixar says that every single one of those Oscar-winning films started off as completely suck. They sucked tremendously, every single one of them, and their job was to unsuck it as they went along. And so, the fact that they are starting with something that's terrible and crappy, that they learned that that was what they had to do. That was the path to it they didn't stop and give up because it was crappy they understood that that was the necessary starting point because they made it a habit out of iterating through these things so for me the creativity is an important part is that iteration where you are producing lots and lots of crap in order to get to the good stuff knowing that that's sort of the price that you have to pay and what happens when you make it a habit in being creative creating things is that you understand that you can throw away all that stuff that you've made knowing that good stuff will come tomorrow that you tomorrow you'll have more ideas so you get the confidence in being able to the confidence that will it allow you to throw away all that stuff because you've done it enough it's a habit that you know oh well tomorrow i'll have some new ideas i'm I, i'm I, i'm i'm a fountain of this because I'm doing this on a regular basis. 
And so that regularity, that habit of it, gives you confidence that, yeah, I spent a year and I'll throw it away as a fine because I have a better idea tomorrow. Excellent. And, and I'm going to draw a parallel, if I may, to the, one of the other um which, which is actually, I think, I, one that I read, and I thought, I wish I'd, know, I wish I'd read this when I was about sixteen. Which is prototype your life um, yeah. and try stuff instead of making grand plans. Yeah, yeah. Tell me a bit about that. Why is that important for people to right. do that? Well, it, first of all, it's in line with what I was just saying about this iteration of arriving things, iterating that you really good, complicated, modern things you have to kind of only get there through a series of iterations and drafts and stuff. And part of that process is what we would call prototyping, where you're making things that you know you're going to throw away. So you make, in the, in the building world, they, they say, well, make one to throw away. So the first one you're going to make and you're going to throw it away, and you know that in the beginning. That's kind of like what a prototype is. And it applies to, to life in general in the sense that um, you want to do things in a kind of iterative, cumulative way. Um, and you want, if you want to make a life decision, you want to see, is there a kind of a minimal viable version of this that I can prototype to see if it works? And I'm always astounded by people who uh, spend four years in law school, graduate with a law degree, and go, and after the first year, they realize that they hate being a lawyer. <laughs> it's like, well, did you intern with a lawyer for a summer? Did you shadow a, a lawyer for several weeks, who a working lawyer, to see what their life was? Did you prototype that in any way? Because if you did, you would understand of you know how the lawyer is spending their days and what it actually is like. And so, if you're going to start a business, rather than kind of quitting your job and starting a business, you have a little side hustle. You have something you're trying to run instead of making a product or some automation of it, you make one of them or two of them by hand. You pretend that you're a machine making this and like, does anybody want it? Does it work? Is it even feasible? You do some modified viable version of something to test it to, to, and you iterate from there. So, um, you know, before you, you take a new job, you, you try it out in some way. And that, um, I find um, is a way in which prevents you from, you have lots of little minor setbacks rather than a major setback. That's, that's the short answer. And, and just talking about, about setbacks, one of the other um, themes that I sort of um, made note of as I was reading the book was about mistakes as well and yeah. how you can learn from mistakes. And right. there was a couple of ones in there which I particularly liked. One, one was about... Um, He's, I think you say nothing elevates a person higher than taking responsibility for their mistakes. Yeah. But also um, the fact that pros make as many mistakes as amateurs, but they've just learned how to gracefully recover from their mistakes. <laughs> so I, I guess my question to you, do you still make mistakes? And yeah. Have you learned from mistakes through, through your life and through your career? Yeah, yes, yes. In fact, um, another one, another bit of advice in the book about mistakes is... Um, this actually came from Esther Dyson. It was a, try to make new mistakes, right? So, so, so the 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 real the real harm with mistakes is making the same mistake over and over. You want to make new mistakes, and that is actually, you know, pretty tough. And for me, um, um, a sign of of growth is that you're still making new mistakes. And um, yes, mistakes. Uh, and, and there's all kinds of mistakes. You know, there's mistakes where you try something that doesn't work. That's that's the most forgiving kind. There's there's mistakes you make in your personal relationships, which is they're harder. There's there's you know moral lapses and those kind of mistakes, which are hard. And then there is going back to what we we're talking before about where you have mistaken ideas, ideas that you change your mind about. And I also love changing my mind and having my mind changed. And that is um, where you have, you know, you have a mistaken belief about something. Um, and, 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 and that's the thing is I am 100% sure that I have mistaken beliefs that my descendants will be embarrassed by. They'll be embarrassed that I believe this. 
I don't know what they are. I, I, I want to know what they are because I would love to change my mind and not believe that now. That would be embarrassing later on. But um, I am certain that, that, I, that I do. That's just my read of history. So um, I think the people I admire most in life are people who are able to change their mind. I, I find that a really high calling that given enough evidence and what they will change their mind. And I also, again, admire the people who will own up to mistakes when they make them. And um, that goes similar to the, the, the act of apology, how to, to do a real honest apology. And um, so, so uh, it's a kind of, um, there's a kind of honesty in, involved, but there's also this kind of a, a flexibility that, that I think is really valuable for living um, a life worth worth things are changing around us. Amazing. Um, Kevin, I'm probably running short on time, but I've got one final question, if I may. And um, one of the ways in which we sort of talk about this, uh, the, the podcast, Google Fast Starts, is about uh, the interested and interesting of the, the kind of communities and industries yeah. that we serve. And one of the quotes I picked out from the book was about um, was about that. It was the more you are interested in others, the more interesting they'll find you. So to yeah. be interesting, be interested. So just in the theme of this and the spirit of this uh, podcast. Uh, so um, if I could just ask why it's so important to you to stay interested. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think... Um, going back to the idea of lifelong learning, I think curiosity is a is a fundamental skill that we don't talk very much about. That is actually far more valuable than it might seem. Um, a lot of of the great new things that happen in the world often start with someone being curious about something that nobody else is. Like uh, there's a little, and I have, I'm working on another little, I'm working on aphorisms that aren't in the book, new ones. And there's one that I'm kind of working on, which is like, um, d don't hunt diamonds, explore pebbles and try to pay attention to things that other people ignore. Because a lot of the great new things come from that curiosity with, with things that other people ignore. And, um, so following your curiosity, a lot of entrepreneur and, and others, that's basically what they're doing. They're, they're, they're curious about something and they kind of follow it, even though other people are ignoring it and think that it's ignorable. Yet that's sort of where that, that edge, that, 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 that far um, ignored terrain is where some of the best ideas and the best new things come from and so that's one of the if i mean this is a very pragmatic practical reason to be curious and to maintain that interestingness interestedness in others Fantastic. I think that's a great uh, point in which to uh, close out the podcast. But Kevin, thank you so much for your insights and for your time. It's been uh, amazing to, to speak to you. And um, if you're watching uh, Google Fast Starters or listening, don't forget to subscribe and to share. But my thanks again to Kevin Kelly for uh, some excellent advice there. And his book, of course, Excellent Advice for the Living, uh, is out now and is, uh, is really excellent. So thank you very much, Kevin. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your questions and your spirit. And um, it's been a delight being here with you.